Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to the fourth session of Elite Coding. Um, our mentors today are going to be Vipasha and Sai Krishna. Um, okay, so I guess Vipasha, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, for sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Vipasha, and I'm currently in my 2B job in computer science. And yeah, that's a lot. Uh, okay, and Sai Krishna, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, for sure. So, um, hey everyone, my name is Sai Krishna. I'm also in my 2B computer science. And uh, this is my third time here being a mentor for EV Coding. Okay. Um, and okay, so today's questions are going to be a rotate image uh, done by Sai Krishna, and Vipasha is going to be doing flood fill. So, I think you guys can. Whoever's going first, we can start sharing the screen. Um, okay, I'll be going first. So let me just share my screen. Um, it says it'll stop where share stream stream sharing. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so this is the question. Can you see my screen? Yep, we can see your screen. Um, so I guess we'll just give you five minutes to kind of go through the question and then we can get started. Does that sound good? Yep, sounds good. I'm just putting the link uh, to the question on the chat as well. Uh, yes, I did go to SATAC. That's awesome, dude. When did you start your um, undergrad? Uh, by the way, you feel free to unmute and like start talking anytime. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll just do that then. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, awesome. Wait, so you went to say tech? That's crazy. I went to yeah. too. When did you start um the uh, Waterloo? Oh, I started like last year, so okay. I just finished my one B ten. What about you? I started fall twenty twenty. Oh fall. okay, okay. So you've been here for a bit. Yeah. That's cool. So what do you do, man? What program are you in? Oh, me? I'm in uh, computer science right now. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Do you remember taking Mr. Fong for CS? Mr. F I had Mr. Kellowan. Oh, Kellowan. Yeah. yeah. I love that guy too, but he retired. Yeah, yeah he retired with my year because um, he's like, he didn't want to teach online because it was too much hassle for him. Yeah. But he was a funny guy. So did you do like grade 11 and 12 online? I did, I think like half of grade 11 online and then grade 12 online, yeah. And then we were the year that didn't get like the, the graduation in person. I see. You guys too, right? Did you guys get an in-person grad? No, we didn't. They did like some virtual graduation, but that yeah. wasn't great. Yeah, I think this year was the, the first year they went back to in-person. Grad. So you missed out on like Ms. Patel's engineering classes and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I heard I heard she's the goat. Oh she's sick dude. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Anyway, um I think Rupasha is gonna start her solution. So message me later if you want, we can like talk for a bit. Yeah, for sure, for sure.
Um, hey, so are you ready to do the solution? Uh, you can give me some suggestions and then we can, you know, start from there. Um, does anyone have any ideas on any test cases or any methods of approach? It doesn't have to be a perfect solution. You can just start from the idea. Could we use, Could we use um, breadth first or depth first search? Yeah, I think uh, one of the solutions would be the most appropriate for this. Because we only have to look at, I mean, that's the, that's the best way and the most efficient way to go through the entire grid without repeating any numbers. But how would we do a breadth first or depth first um, with the 2D array? Um, so usually breadth first search and depth first search is done using a stack or a key, uh, depending on which one, which start which search you're going with. So we can just store the coordinates for the X act for the, the X coordinate and the Y coordinate in two separate queues or lists. And then using that we can do an index based search. And that's how you would do a breadth for search or a depth for search. Awesome. So um just a note for anyone who joined recently. Um Vipasha is doing the first problem which is Lee code 733 flood fill. Um, so we just started, if anyone has any ideas about how to solve this or, um, any test case or anything, feel free to speak up at any time. Um, she just mentioned how we could use either breadth first or depth first search to solve this problem. So yeah, I'm going to let her resume. Um, I'll just give the new participants for two more minutes so they can kind of go through the question and then we'll start coding.
Uh, okay, let's just get started. Um, do Do you guys know what a queue or a, what a stack is? Do you have Do you know what they are? You can type it out in the chat. You don't have to say anything. Okay, do you know what? Uh, I'm assuming you guys know what a queue and a stack is. Do you know what a breadth first search means or depth first search means or what the difference between the two is? What's the difference with Russia? Okay, so I'm just going to draw the simple tree and then I can explain the difference between the two. So this would be the root node. Uh, just put in some comments. So this would be the root node. And then we have a binary tree has only a left node and the right node. So we just stick with binary trees for the moment. And this is their, this is its children. Okay, so this is our binary tree. And a breadth first search and depth first search are methods of traversal to make sure that you go through the entire tree without repeating any nodes in the tree. So each point in this tree is called each vertex in this tree is a node. So the nodes in this tree are one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And the uh, breadth first search is basically if you go through, it will go linearly. So we'll start with one, then it traverse two, three, four, five, six, seven. But depth first search, on the other hand, will go from one, two, then to four, five, then it will go from go to three, and then six, seven. That's the difference between depth first search and depth first search. And Q and stacks are the data structures that are used to do to go through breadth first search and depth first search iteratively. So a queue is basically a data structure where it's, which, which is a FIFO um, like concept, which is first in first out. So whichever numbers enter in first, they, they're the ones that uh, leave first and a stack is a last in first out. First, yeah, so it is the numbers that, are come, that go in first, they'll be the ones to leave last. So for a breadth first search, we use a queue. So you start with number one in the queue, and then you see which L if one has any left or right tree, right uh, nodes. So in this case, we do it. It has two and three. So then two and three get added to the queue. Then you uh, then one and one leaves the queue. Then you check if the if two has a left and a right. So then it does. We know that it has four and five. So four and five get added to the queue. And then you remove two from the queue. Now we see if three has a left and a right node. In this case, we see that it has a, it does six and seven. So that gets added to the queue. And now seven gets removed, from, or three gets removed from the queue. Now we look at four. Four doesn't have a left or right. So we just remove it and nothing gets added to the queue. Similarly for five, we see that there's nothing on the left and right. So we remove it and there's nothing added to the queue. And last we check for six and seven. Again, we see for both of them that nothing is in the queue. So nothing is there for the left and right, so we just remove it from the queue. So this is a depth first search, and we saw that it traversed through the entire tree, going from one to going from one to two to three to four, five, six, and seven. Now, if we have to do a depth first search, we would use a stack. So we would start with same one, and then we'll check if it has a left and right. It does two and three. So two and three get added to it. First, we remove one, and then we add two and three. So now we check if uh, two has anything. So two, we see that two has four and five. So four and five get added to it. But instead of checking two, we now check if five has anything on the left and right. We see that it doesn't. So we remove it from the stack. Then similarly, we check if four has anything on the left and right. We see that it doesn't. So we remove it from the stack. Lastly, we check if three has uh, anything on the left and right. We see that it has six and seven. So now this app gets added to the stack. Now, again, we see that six and seven has nothing on the left and right. So it gets removed from the stack and even three gets removed because we already traversed through its children. And lastly, we already traversed through two children. So this also gets added from the stack. So here we see that we traversed through the entire tree, but we went from one, two, four, five, and then three, six, and seven. 
Now in this prob particular problem, we would be using breadth of search because we only want to see what's around. So the question is asking us to fill, to change the color. So each number is a color and it has to change the colors of all the adjacent uh, square, squares only if it matches this, the center part, the starting uh, color. So in this case, we'd use a breadth first search because we only have to check the ones that are next to it. We don't care about the next, the one adjacent to that. That'll have, that will automatically be taken care of if we do a breadth first search. So to implement a breadth first search in an array, we, uh, instead of a tree, we can just have two separate queues to store the coordinates for all the, the X coordinates and the Y coordinates. And then we can use um, index based search to find out to find each of the grids, to find each of the grids and check if it's if we have to change the color, if, if it doesn't have to change. So for that, um, first I'll create a list. Um, there is an inbuilt queue. I'm using C sharp to code it. There is an inbuilt queue structure, but I, I used a list, so I'll just continue with that. And I'll call the X coordinates fill X. So this is how we do it. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Does anyone have any questions on how to do breadth for search, depth for search, or on the data structures, Q and stuff? I think we're all good in chat. Okay. So um, I'm just going to continue. So since we know that we have to start with the starting point that's given to us, and we know that the starting row is given here and the starting column is given here. So I just initialize the start of this list with the starting and starting row. And similarly for the column, I'll call it fill Y and I'll put the starting column as the first number in this. Now the question says that it has to, it's only four directionally. So we only have to, we only care about the four directions, the top, the bottom, the right, and the left. And now if we, um, I'm just going to draw a simple grid. So this is point one, point two, point three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Assuming we start at five, the point here would be zero comma zero, assuming this is our origin. So now, since we only care about two, four, six, and eight, uh, the coordinates for two in relation to zero comma zero would be my minus one because we're one row up and the column number would be zero because it's the same column as uh, the one below. It's the same column as this point. Um, for people who just joined, I'm doing the flatbread question, which is 733. And I'm, I just started solving the problem. And um, yeah, I'm using a breadth first search algorithm to solve the question. So the call, the top one would be minus one comma zero. The bottom similarly be one comma zero because it's one row at the bottom. And the right column, the row is the same. So that would be zero, but the column is one ahead. So it would be plus one. And similarly, the row here would be the same, but it's in a negative, it's one column to the left. So this would be minus one. So we only, we can see that the directions, uh, this is how the directions can be mapped out. So I'll just have an array, which will have the directions for all X and Y as minus one, zero, minus one, zero, one, and zero. And similarly for Y, we'll have zero, one, and zero minus one. So now when we, try to find all the adjacent points. We don't have, we only have to go through this array because that will give us all these, all the four adjacent points to the center point. So now that we have this, we can start solving the question. So we know that on, we only have to go through the, go through the algorithm when either the fill X or the fill Y is not empty. And since both of them are going to be going at the same time, like the amount, that we remove from each of them is the same. We just have to check if it none, if one of it is not equal to zero. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? Okay. 
Okay, so um, I'm just gonna continue. And we should, um, I forgot to mention, we should also have an array, a two dimensional array, which stores up, stores the value, it, which keeps track of whether each point in the, each um, square in the grid was visited or not, so that we don't visit the same grid again, causing, uh, causing us to go into an infinite loop. So I'm just gonna create a new, uh, two dimensional array and this is going to be the length of the grid and so in c sharp the default value for a, a boolean array is false so i don't have to initialize each in every um i don't have to initialize it let initialize it for me i just have to do the basic stuff and this will be the length of the first row because it's an n by n column, m by n grid, not an n by n grid. So now that we have all of this ready, we can solve the problem. So first, I'm going to find the current, the current x and the current y values, which is where the pointer is at the moment. So in this example, it would be in the center. So I'm going to call it current car x, and that would be the first value in the list. So it would be fill x at zero. And similarly for y, it's the first value. So it will be fill y at zero. Now we have to remove it from the list because we've already passed through it. So I'm just gonna do fill x dot remove at zero and for the same way for y. Now we need to add all of its neighbors. So in this case, it would be this one, this one, the zero, and the zero. So for, to do this, I'm going to go through the direction vectors of x and y, and I'm going to see if it's in, and if there's always a case where it might not be part of the grid. For example, if we were in the top left corner over here, it doesn't have any grid on the top or on the left. So we have to make sure that it doesn't go out of bounds. So we'll have a check for that to ensure that it never goes out of bounds. So I'm going to loop through only four times because we know that there's only four direction vectors. And I'm going to call it new x, which would be the current x plus the direction vector of x at that point. And similarly for y, now we're going to check that this value is not out of bounds. So new of x has to be, um, so if it's greater than, if it's less than zero, or if new x is greater than or equal to the length of the image, the length of the array, then we continue because we don't want to execute the, the rest of the code. It will go back to the beginning of the loop. Similarly for y, if new y is less than zero, or new y is greater than or equal to the row, the length of the rows, the length of the columns, sorry, then we'd continue. And last, we don't want to uh, add what's already been visited again to the queue. So I'm just going to check if this, the visited at current X and current Y, sorry, the visited at new X and new Y is not false. If it's true, then we continue because it's already been visited and we don't want to add it again to the queue. Now that we've made all these checks, we can safely add it to the queue because we know that it's not been visited and it's not out of bounds. So I added for X and for Y. And now that this has been added, I'm gonna do the check to see if it's the start. If now I'm gonna check if the current values in the, in the grid so the current X and the current Y, if both of these are the same, if this point, so for example, if we take, a, if you look at this pixel, this pixel color has to be the same as the starting pixel color. So if it's the same as this, and this point has not been visited before, then we change this point to the new color. And we set the visited value to true. 
so that next time when we we look at the same point again, we don't add it to the queue. This would like we don't want it to go into an infinite loop, right? So this is why we do this. Yeah, and this should be, and then we'll return. This will so now this will take care of all the cases, and now we should be we should return the image because this will have all the new changes. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay, I'm just gonna run this to see if it passes these cases. Let's see why the timing would exceed it. Oh, I didn't check if this is false. Okay, so I'm just going to go through the code and see where it could possibly um, go into an infinite loop. So we're first taking, we're taking the current value of x and the current uh, y coordinate, and we're also removing it from point zero so that it, um, it gets removed from the queue. We're then checking if it's, if the current, the new, we're then taking the new value, which is the current x and the direction vector for x and the direction vector for y. Then we're also checking if it's not, if it's part, if the, it's not out of bounds from the array. And if it is, then we're continuing. Similarly, we're checking if the visited values are true or not. And if it's true, then we continue. We don't, we don't have to add it to the queue because we don't want to visit it again. Okay, so the issue is that we only have to add it if it's the same pixel color as the starting pixel color. Because if it's not, then we don't have to change the color, right? Because that's what the question is asking. So I'm just going to add a check to see if the new values are the same as the starting pixel colors. <laughs> So now we should fix the issue. Okay. Now let's see what the error is. Okay. So now this is. the current value. So we see that only the center value is not changing, which is the center value or so. Okay, so none of the values are changing. Let's see. Okay, so we are adding the new index indices, so this should not be an issue.
um, what Asha said. Mm -hmm. So we only have 20 minutes left for this session. I think um, we sort of get exactly um, what we're trying to do. There's probably like a time instant here. Though. So how about we move on to question two? Sure, uh, we can come back to this if we have time. Awesome. awesome. Um, so yeah, we are now going to move on to um, the second problem for today's session, which is Lee code 48 rotate image. So I'm going to be sharing my screen. Um, Awesome. So the problem is you're given an N by N 2D matrix representing an image, and they want us to rotate the image by 90 degrees clockwise. You do, you have to rotate the image in place, which means you have to modify the input 2D matrix directly. Um, do not allocate another 2D matrix and do the rotation. So um, the way that they gave us the 2D matrix is in the form of a, a 2D array or in this case, because I will be coding in C sharp, it's technically called a jagged array, um, but the concept is basically the same thing as that of a 2D array. And let's try to see if we can uh, look at any patterns for how to do the rotation before we begin actually writing any code. So looking at the first example, we see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And we need to transform this into seven, four, one, eight, five, two, nine, six, three. So the pattern that I notice is that if we were to take our starting matrix and we were to do a rotation around a diagonal rotation. So I'll show you what that means in one second. And then we were to flip it vertically, uh, flip it along its vertical axis. Then we're gonna end up with this. So what I mean by a diagonal rotation is if we did this, where we instead get one, four, seven, two, five, eight, three, six, nine so in this case we see that all we turn all of the columns or all of the rows into the columns so initially our first row was one two three which is now going to be our first column one two three then our second row is four five six which is going to stay um, as our second column four five six then our final row is seven eight nine which is going to become our final column seven eight nine so once we turn this into this form, if we just do a flip around the vertical axis, uh, our axis around the middle, we're gonna end up with our answer right here. So what that means is we take the one over here and the seven over here and we swap them. We take the two and eight over here, we swap them. We take the three and nine over here and we swap them. And then we end up with our final answer like that. So um, let's jump into the code. We see that we have to do two things. So we need to do a diagonal rotation. So I'm gonna call a function called um, diagonal rotation. And then once we have our diagonal rotation finished, we need to do a vertical or a vertical rotation or a vertical flip, I'm just gonna call it flip. So, for, so let's jump into the code for the diagonal rotation. And let's take a closer look at what happens in this case. If I were to take a simple two by two example, so one, two, three, four, the output that I want is one, three, two, four. 
right? So what ended up happening is that if I do a, a coordinate by coordinate placing, the one in this uh, two by two matrix is located at zero, zero. Then the two is located at zero, one. The three is then located at one, zero. And the four is located at one, one. Now we see that the one and the four stay in the same place, but the three and the two swap. Now, if you scale this up to um, a matrix of greater size, so three by three, four by four, you'll notice that every for every coordinate, ij basically becomes ji. And that's how we get the new matrix. Um, and for anyone who's taken a linear algebra and linear algebra class, uh, this operation is called transpose. So I call it diagonal rotation. The actual name is transpose. So I'm just going to call it that for now. The first thing we need to do is find the transpose of our matrix. And the way that we do that is by basically doing a swap for all of the coordinates by making ij become ji, where i represents the row and j represents the column coordinate. Now, the issue with this is that we need to do it in place. So if we go, with, go through every single coordinate and do the transpose, then we're going to end up with the exact same starting matrix. So what we need to do is we need to only do it for either above the diagonal line or below the main diagonal line, right? Because if we did it for every coordinate, then two gets swapped with four, which is the desired effect where two would end up here and four would end up here. But then eventually when we get to the four, the four would be, um, would be swapped back to the two. So when we're at this position, ij, it becomes ji. Then eventually when we come here, it goes back to here which means we've done nothing. So what we need to do is we need to be able to do a transpose and we only want to select the coordinates that are at or above this main diagonal here. Alternatively, you can do below, but I'm going to do above because it's a little bit more straightforward. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be trying to set up a way for me to iterate for all of the coordinates that are at or above the main diagonal. Uh, since I need to go through each of the rows, um, let me iterate through each row. So for int i is equal to zero, i is less than matrix dot length, i plus plus. So now basically I have each of the rows. And now for each of the columns, what I want is, I want it to be past the main diagonal. Now, um, what's convenient is that we have a square matrix. Um, we would have, uh, which makes our life quite a bit easier actually, because we can just do this where we do four int j is equal to i, j is less than matrix at zero dot length. Oh, sorry, matrix dot length. Zero dot length would also work, but it's a square matrix. Um, so we might as well just take the, the matrix's length itself, um, j plus plus. And I will explain why this works in one second. Then now that we have all the i and j coordinates, we're going to want to swap them. Um, so that's just a quick swap. And then matrix at i j is equal to matrix at j i. Then matrix at j i is equal to 10. All right, so the reason that this works um, with selecting each of the um, items that are past the diagonal in a given row is because it is in fact a square coordinate. So when we're on the first row, we wanna, se we wanna select all the items that are including and after the first item. When we're on the second row, we wanna do everything including and after the second item. Third row, everything including and after the third item. Um, and in this example with the fourth, the same holds true. So what I can do is make my life easier by just initializing J to equal I. Uh, that way I get everything at and um, past the main diagonal. So this function will basically do the transpose of the matrix. So again, uh, a flip about this axis right here, uh, one, five, nine. Now what I wanna do is I wanna do a vertical flip. So let's code that.
Now, what I notice here is that for every row, I need to take items that are on opposite ends and swap them. So basically, I need to do a reflection about the middle of the um, each row, right? So the first thing I need to do is able to iterate through each of the rows. So that's I'm going to do that the exact same way I did that for the transpose function. Now, since I'm trying to do a reflection, what I can do is I can find the distance from each coordinate to the middle, and then I can swap it with the item that is on that is the exact same distance from the other side, right? So, for example, if I were to take um, the array given by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, where five would be in the middle, I'm just going to make that a little more obvious. I see that the distance that one is from five is four units, right? Because there's two, three, four, five. Now nine is also four units away, right? Because there's six, seven, eight, nine. So once I have that, I just swap them, nine, one. Um, likewise for two, two is three units away from five. So then I grab whatever's three units away on the other side, which would be an eight and do a swap. Oh, sorry, that should be a two. Um, that should be an eight. And then likewise, I would get seven over here and I'd swap it with the three over here because they're both two units away. And then at one unit away, the six and the four. And then the five stays the same. Um, and in the case where there is no middle, so there's an even number of units, the same still holds. So the way that I'm gonna be doing this is that I'm only gonna be iterating through half the list and flipping it with the other half. Right, so for int j is equal to zero, j is less than matrix dot length divided by two this time because we only want half, j plus plus. Then again, I'm gonna do a quick swap. So int temp is equal to matrix at i j. Now, this is the first item. So the item to the left of um, the middle of the left of the axis, right? So now we want the equivalent item on the right of the axis and we wanna swap their places. So that would be matrix at ij is equal to whatever is completely on the other side, which in this case would be matrix at i. And then again, now in here, matrix dot length minus j this time, because we want what's on the other side. Um, and now since indexes are always, uh, index base, so they start at zero, well, we're gonna do a minus one right here. Um, otherwise, the matrix dot length would give us whatever the maximum length is, plus one, and then we'd get an index out of bound error. So likewise, we just wanna do a quick swap over here, grab that same thing and set it to equal temp. So yeah, we basically transpose the matrix, then we do a vertical flip, and that should be it. So when I run this code, I should get an error because I didn't put a semicolon here. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna give it a minute to time out. Alternatively, what you can do is you can do a horizontal flip. So swap your rows where your first row is your last, your second row is your second last, your third row becomes your third last. Flip it like that and then do a diagonal flip. Both of them would be the same. I just thought this would be a little bit easier to implement. So um, I chose to do the diagonal flip or the transpose first. There's my issue. There we go. Um, and yeah, so that should be the solution to this problem. Um, let's submit and see what happens. Awesome. 
so yeah, that was just um, a quick and easy one with a little bit of linear algebra involved. Um, yeah, so the time complexity of this uh, should be O of n because um, the for loops go only as big as the input array is. So it's completely dependent. If the input array or matrix is a lot larger than a three by three or a four by four, then it would depend on whatever that is. So since it's linear, it would be O of n. And then the space complexity is O of one because we're doing the matrix um, rotations in place, um, be it the transpose or the diagonal flips. Um, and the only additional variable that we're declaring is our temporary variable uh, when we're trying to perform the swap. And that is basically the solution to this problem. Thank you so much. So we're going to have, um, since we have a couple minutes left, we're going to have Vipasha go back to her problem and um, yeah, finish explaining her solution. Uh, so the issue that I, the mistake that I made was I didn't store the starting pixel color in a, uh, in a, a variable because when I, when we try to check if it's matching the starting pixel, we change it in the, in this condition. So then the starting pixel color changes. But we actually want to check for the original one, not the new one, which is why it wasn't running. So now if we run the code, it should work fine. Yeah, so this accepted. And yeah, and so we see that it passes. Now for the time complexity, uh, breadth first search and depth first search is O of n, which is where n is the number of nodes that are present in the tree. And the space complexity is also O of n because we have a list which stores the length of, which um, stores all the coordinates. And it's, the length will keep changing depending on how many nodes you're going to traverse through, right? So that's O of n. Uh, yeah, that's about it. So thank you so much for attending today, guys. Um, I hope this session was very useful to you. Um, and I hope to see you guys, we hope to see you guys next week. Bye.